1992 to uh, interview fishermen who had worked uh, fishing at uh, six rings uh, between the First and Second World War, and that was really my introduction to uh, Shetlandic uh, folklore history uh, and, uh, and through associated uh, site visits, uh, archaeology. Can, can you hear me in the back? Uh, yeah, that's, that's no? No. How's that? I can just speak up. There should be one. That's on there. Yeah. Is it? Yeah? Do we have it? Should I just speak up? There we are. Yeah, okay. That, that, that sounds really great. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to a, a posture here. But, um, but I have, have been excavating uh, in Orkney uh, really for 20 years uh, and thinking more holistically about the Northern Isles and the, the wider North Sea Irish Sea uh, and North Atlantic context. Uh, and today I'd, I'd like to uh, develop by thinking about what it, <laughs> if you like, uh, you know, what all the scrabbling about, you know, looking at settlement sites, fish ponds, etc., uh, for 20 years might, might actually mean. Uh, and to do that, I'd like to, to ultimately develop a hypothesis, uh, which I made in a much shorter context uh, here in, in, in Shetland last summer, to, uh, to I think it would be fair to say, a relatively sceptical audience. So, uh, so being given the luxury to expand it a little in, in this context uh, with 45 minutes, I, I thought I'd try it out again. And if you remain sceptical, then I will shelve it forever. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, on, the, on the other hand, um, you know, if you're persuaded with, um, uh, you know, then, uh, then, then perhaps I'll uh, carry on with it. But let's get the... Right, well, to start with, laughing playfully at the threats of a menacing ocean. Um, where does that come from? Well, some of you might know, that's uh, a description of the Northern Isles that comes from Adam of Bremen, the, in the history of the Archbishops of Hamburg and Bremen from the late 11th century. And, and this is a source which is perhaps uh, interestingly well informed about the Northern Isles, which amongst other things discusses the introduction of the, the bishopric. Uh, of Orkney, and uh, it, it can be taken very much as a literary flourish, but at the same time I think that we can imagine that it actually is more meaningful than that, and I think it, it encapsulates either, either purposefully through information from the Danish king Sven Estridsen, uh, who was Adam's main informant on these matters, um, or, or through ecclesiastical roots, uh, that it might actually be instead encapsulating a element of how those in the Northern Isles actually imagine themselves and wish others to imagine them. Now, the questions I want to frame uh, is firstly something which perhaps is, has been done and dusted, but I think needs to be uh, reviewed at least uh, briefly, which is how is it that the Northern Isles, the Open of Orkney, of course, including Shetland, can be perceived in those fleeting glimpses we have of it in the Long Viking Age, in the 11th century, the centuries on either side, uh, as being a kind of dark horse of history that was anomalously wealthy and powerful. And, and is this real, uh, or is this illusory? And if it is real, uh, how could it come to be? And then, ultimately, the hypothesis I want to address is what the implications, the answer of that, have for the wider currents of social and economic changes uh, in the Irish Sea and the North Sea between 900 and 1200. And it's ultimately driven by a paradox which was observed by Benjamin Hudson, which is that it's exactly at the point that Norwegian kings are beginning to attempt to exert direct influence in the West, make this Berlings obviously most significantly, that the evidence for actual exchange and regular transit between Norway and the Irish Sea region, obviously via the Northern Isles, is actually diminishing. And he didn't answer that question, but I think it was extremely interesting that he raised it. <coughs> 
And so what are we talking about? Of course, we're talking about the, the, or the, the geographical boundaries of which were fluid through time, typically including the archipelagos of both Orkney and Shetland, but also, of course, mainland Caithness, Sutherland, uh, and if the poetry of individuals like Anar Yatlaskal of the early 11th century can believe, potentially also including substantial areas uh, of Scotland uh, down into the Irish Sea zone, conceivably at times control of the Isle of Man. <coughs> well, was it wealthy and powerful? The simple answer, of course, is, is yes. And the evidence for that comes from a whole suite of sources. In terms of material culture, of course, it includes the hoard evidence of the 10th and 11th <coughs> centuries, the scale cord, that is 8 kilograms of silver, being one of the larger in Scandinavia, if one excludes the exceptional gauntlet hoards. Uh, but also later hoards like Furry that we're looking at here from around the year 1000 at 2 kilograms of silver. But also, of course, for monumental architecture as one moves beyond the period of silver deposition uh, into the 12th century with be it St. Magnus' Cathedral, uh, St. Magnus' Agassiz, uh, and so on. And now one of the curious elements of the, the hoard evidence, and is it is it better to turn these lights on? Yes. Yeah. So do you think we could have the ones in the front of the hall down? Is that something I should try to do? That'd be very unwise. <coughs> I'll carry on while they're investigating. So one of the really interesting things about the hoard evidence uh, is that the introduction of these uh, particular <coughs> consciously anachronistic weight-adjusted rings, the so-called ring money, uh, this stuff in the very hoard. And it, of course, silver weight-adjusted rings were common in the bullion economy of Viking Age Scandinavia, you know, across the northern world. Um, but this particular type is very, very late. And it's based on its distribution, almost certainly manufactured in Scandinavian Scotland, <coughs> presumably uh, the Northern Earldom. Uh, so it's from 950 to 1050. And it's at a time when coinage is being minted in those other areas of the insular Viking West, the Isle of Man, Dublin, for instance. So this is a conscious inaccuracy. So this is a decision to not use coin. And it's also a, a, a self-consciously, almost like iconoclastically plain kind of silver ornament. It's very different from uh, the ball type or thistle brooches, for instance, uh, that one might be seeing manufactured in the Irish Sea province at the same time. Um, so we have to think about what's going on with this wealth. It's not just uh, an expression of wealth. It's an expression of a particular kind of wealth uh, with a particular mentality that um, maybe is, is giving us hints of this laughing playfully um, you know, at the, at the sea. It's, uh, it, it's a, an, an economy which, uh, which is constructing itself, and a society which is constructing itself uh, differently uh, from those elsewhere. Uh, and at some periods, at least, perhaps slightly less ostentatiously, uh, albeit uh, you know, that gets dropped as one moves into the 12th century. Uh, but this is just an example uh, of one of these rings, and of course, a lot of the evidence that I'm discussing, the clearest evidence for uh, elite investment, uh, comes from the Orcanian part of the earldom. But that isn't to suggest that Shetland is outside that system. And we have a, a variety of ways in which we can get insights into that connection. And one of them is this ring money, where there's an example, for instance, uh, actually in a settlement site at House One in Yarosal. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about archaeological evidence, uh, superficially and accept, um, but what about the historical evidence? Well, of course, we have a variety of often anecdotal uh, textual sources, uh, contemporary Irish annals, the non-contemporary, uh, except for the 12th century king sagas, uh, the synoptic histories of the 12th century, and a variety of Scottish and English chronicle traditions. Uh, but if one assembles the evidence from all of these, then we have a variety of quite diverse indicators uh, of the, the non-trivial wealth and power uh, of the Northern Earldom. And the first, of course, is direct military action. You know, be at the Battle of Clontarf, um, you know, it's obviously an anniversary of 1014. Um, 
But uh, also, interestingly, the harboring of exiles. And, and the, the most uh, valuable example here is that of Calf Artisan. Now, this is an 11th century incident where uh, an individual uh, who's related by marriage to Thorfinn Sigurdsson, the Earl of Orkney, uh, has fallen out with Magna Sigurd. And you probably know that Magna Sigurd was the successor of St. Olaf, who came back from Exile Novgorod to take over a substantial chunk of Canute the Great's Northern Empire, Norway, and for periods of time, uh, also Denmark. Well, Cap Arneson had stayed in Norway during his exile and, in fact, been implicated uh, in the, the, ultimately the death of St. Olaf. And to begin with, there was a reconciliation between the two, but ultimately, as Magnus's power grew, Cap had to get out of Dodge. Um, and where did he go when he got out of Dodge? He went with his retinue to stay with Thorpe and Sigurdsson, Earl of Orkney. It was not very many days' sail from Western Norway uh, to Orkney. And so the implications of the capacity of Thorfinn to, to harbor uh, an exile like that, I think, are, are non-trivial. Um, and payments of large fines, uh, the variety of contexts that one might draw on here, but uh, most significantly, obviously, the results of the Battle of Florabowa in 1194, uh, but also payments by Harold Madison to William the Lion of 2,000 pounds of silver uh, in 1202, at the very end of our chronology. So, I mean, these are scattered anecdotes, but uh, you know, uh, collectively that uh, paint, I think, a fairly clear picture. And the royal and aristocratic marriages, of course, are perhaps the clearest evidence of all. Uh, and when one's looking at the 12th century, we have good historically recorded alliances to the highest level of Scottish magnate society, where Harold Madison uh, is marrying daughters of the Earl of Athol, and later the Earl of Ross, who's a, a, a pretender contestant uh, for the Scottish crown. Um, but in the 11th century, we have less um, and reliable, but nevertheless probably true, historical anecdotes about marriage alliances with Malcolm II, Malcolm III of Scotland, uh, or if not Malcolm II, and certainly uh, Malcolm of Murray, with, in the context of Thorpe and Sigurdsson, uh, and, um, and then later uh, his widow Sigurd, um, first and then Thorpe and Sigurdsson. So, we have a, a, a background corpus of both archaeological and historical evidence, which, however scattered, however anecdotal, probably corroborates a notion we get from sources like the Kogad, uh, this um, propaganda text relating to the Battle of Clontarf, uh, which tries to paint uh, the uh, Orcadian contingent of the Battle of Clontarf as this kind of, you know, sort of uh, malignant uh, evil force from the north that, that uh, you know, is sort of disproportionately powerful. Um, you know, the sources like that, obviously, it's difficult to take at face value, rightly so. Um, and, and it's partly from those uh, that we have this tradition of thinking of the Earl of Him being uh, so significant. And, but if one pieces together uh, this much wider corpus of archaeological and historical evidence, we begin to see that there is a, a, a genuine historicity uh, to that notion. Okay, well, I'd like to, to make that uh, far more concrete now with examples from my own excavations at uh, uh, two settlements at the opposite ends of the social scale. One of them is a small, probably tenant firm uh, at Quaker in Westray, and the other is uh, what I would argue, uh, following others, is an elite chiefly settlement at the Brock of Dunas. Now, the interesting thing about Quaigru is that the evidence for basic domestic economic production uh, is, uh, is very changeable through time. There's a, a fairly straightforward boom and bust cycle with an increase in the production of everything in the 11th, 12th, and just into the 13th centuries. And one could see that in Arab agriculture. One could see that in pastoral agriculture, the increases in butter production, as inferred from the calling of young cows, for instance. And one can see it in the maritime economy in terms of the acquisition of shellfish, probably like mostly bait, uh, and in terms of the production of dried cod and related family fish. Some of it for local consumption, the payment of dues, butter, for instance, rent, tax, and tithe. Some of it probably ultimately for export, insofar as the products um, that elite extraction, if you like, 
uh, that paid as rent tax and fine are ultimately the products of export, as uh, inferred from later stock arrivals. So we can see, for instance, through time, there's a more fish bone inside, 170 kilograms of it. There's greater um, intensity of bait collection through time with the shells, of the, the limpets, which are the main shellfish, getting smaller through time, <coughs> and even changing shape so that people are actually going farther down the foreshore in order to collect the bait through time. And I'm just pulling out a few examples to give you a flavor. And uh, this uh, very substantial increase in the degree of culling of young calves and the amount of neonatal cattle in the assemblages, which are probably related to an increase in butter production. Butter, of course, being key for the production, uh, for the payment uh, of rent, uh, tax, and time. And there's, there's even an incident from the 1220s in which the Bishop of Caithness is actually burned in his kitchen because he uh, attempts to increase uh, the scale of the butter tide. So this, is, this isn't a, a, a trivial enterprise. And at the same time, um, perhaps surprisingly, perhaps not, despite the fact that this is a small settlement, <coughs> not a wealthy settlement, on a small island, about 15 kilometers long, uh, almost all of the portable the Taylor culture of these two centuries at Koi Group was <coughs> from outside the archipelago of Orkney. It included some objects which could be sourced relatively closely, soapstone vessels, uh, but some of them based on chemical provenancing from Shetland, some of them from Norway, uh, but also, uh, in particular, objects from Norway itself. We like imported uh, combs uh, and imported whetstones. Uh, most of the stone objects from the site uh, are actually of raw material uh, which could not be native to the islands. And if you put them together, one imagines a scenario where there's surplus production, dried fish and grain, which is moving up the social system, ultimately, ultimately being exported to centers like Bergen, when it becomes on stream towards the end of the 11th century, uh, and then transshipped to European centers of consumption, where, of course, it's, it's recognized uh, in the relevant uh, historical records of England and Germany. And if we, if we want, um, you know, in the Northern Course one at this period is always working with anecdotal evidence. Um, but we are given a gift of this quote from Sparisvang in relation to his speech against drunkenness. And this, one of his classic sources, which is actually just getting really cross because everybody's drinking lots of German wine um, and it's leading to social disruption. Uh, and in this context, he gives a speech where he thinks those from Orkney, Shetland, and the Pharaohs um, who are bringing all these things that make us so richer. It doesn't actually say, unfortunately, what's coming from these places, uh, but immediately in the next line, uh, he gets cross at the Germans uh, who've come intending to carry away butter and dried fish, uh, who are, of course, bringing the wine in return. And so it is pretty unambiguous, obviously, that some of what's coming from here uh, is what's going there. And, uh, here we are in the second half of the 12th century. Right, okay, so we have an element of the way that wealth is generated. Uh, it's quite straightforward, rural, surplus production, uh, variously in, in an Orcadian context, particularly dried fish and butter. Of course, in a Shetlandic context, inferring from slightly later historical records, uh, almost certainly also both now, uh, wool cloth which was disproportionately significant in the northern of the two archipelagos. Um, and uh, although I haven't discussed it explicitly, we also know from Icelandic sources that going north, uh, as counterintuitive as it might seem from a Canadian who's now living in England, it's me, uh, the, there was uh, the export of cereal grain, uh, particularly barley products, from Orkney to uh, Iceland. So we have a generation of wealth at that primary uh, economic productive level, at a peasant level, if you like. Um, but meanwhile, what were the elite doing? Well, they were collecting the rent the tax and exporting it for the trappings of elite life, of course, uh, including silver. Um, but, uh, but they were also doing something else, and that is piracy and mercenary activity. 
And there's no ambiguity about this. And it's, uh, it's interesting because you know, when, when one reads a source like Ordinga Saga, and many of you probably have, perhaps all of you, and we uh, read the kind of the fictionalized life of the historical, we know based on later Icelandic sources, character of the pirate Sven Asleperson, for instance. Um, you know, we, we imagine, even the editors of the, of the saga described it as being a kind of anachronism, a throwback to the Viking Age. Well, of course, it's no such thing. It's actually describing the reality of how uh, an aspiring magnate or aristocrat in 12th century, uh, you know, or near Shetland makes their living. They do so by engaging in piracy and mercenary activity, the, the boundary between which, of course, is exceptionally blurred. Um, the classic and earliest <coughs> case, of course, is the Battle of Clontarfon Island, uh, but it's not the only one. We get another picture uh, from contemporary sources during Magnus Haraldsson's invasion of England in 1058. Uh, that's the son of Harold Hadrada, of course, who goes on and doesn't, you know, it, it, it attempted um, an invasion in 1066. This is a, an earlier, much less known precursor. Uh, but of course, uh, at the Battle of Stamford Bridge itself, there is an Arcadian contention fighting. And uh, presumably, uh, the anticipation was that there would be some reward for that endeavor. Um, and one can see that continuing well into the 12th century, uh, really, until its end. The, the Orcadians are at the Battle of Standard in North Yorkshire in 1138. What are Orcadians doing in the Battle of the Standard? It's utterly bizarre. Um, sorry, I'm being a little bit flippant. Um, but, uh, but, I mean, you know, clearly, they're, they're going to uh, reap some reward for the endeavor. Um, and, uh, and, of course, uh, famously, uh, there's an Islanders contingent at the attempt to retake Dublin from the Anglo-Normans in 1171. And the likelihood is uh, that this is led by the semi-fictional uh, Sven Asigerson uh, of Ornegi Sega of Um and, uh, and of course, uh, the, you know, the kind of ultimate uh, expression of this uh, in, a, in a, an Eastern rather than Western context uh, is the participation of large numbers of Isle men uh, in the attempt at rebellion against Sparrow, which is ultimately unsuccessful, uh, with many of them dying at the Battle of Florida in 1194. But of course, that has enormous consequences for you know, the, the very foundations of this political economy, because Shetland is taken under direct Norwegian royal control, uh, and at least for a time, Harold Madison <coughs> has to accept Norwegian <coughs> administration of the Earl of Morphy as well. It doesn't last so long, because as, as soon as Sparrow dies, Harold has the Norwegian administrative merit. Um, but it's, a, it's the beginning of the end. Right, okay. Well, <coughs> having sketched that outline, again, let's try to make it concrete uh, with, a, with a, a, you know, a, a settlement site on, on the ground where this may actually have been happening. Uh, and that is arguably the Brock of Dearness. Um, these kind of stack sites aren't unique. And they were once thought to be ecclesiastical hermitages, and some may still be. And I'll come back to that related to the specific areas <coughs> in a moment. But uh, arguably, they'd also make very sensible, cheap strongholds. Uh, it's an easily defended settlement with a, a landing site, a spatial hierarchy, and a chapel interpreted by Chris Morris as a private chapel or Agincourt, Agincourt of uh, an elite settlement. I think that he was probably right in that. You can get a sense of the uh, house foundations from these Arab photographs. Um, the Arab photograph, which is on your left, was taken while it was grazed by sheep, so you can see the earthworks quite clearly. Uh, and the high-resolution GPS survey picks those up in your right. OK, this is what the settlement looks like. Um, it's not a town, of course, but it is a nucleated settlement. And it was probably set up by somebody who had been to Dublin, or been to York, or at least had a cousin or an uncle or a brother who had been. It's got that kind of an element of a mental template with a, a, a kind of street plan uh, with houses on either side. The entrance comes through here to one uh, central hall, which is larger than all the other buildings, and of course to the settlement, possibly from its Scandinavian beginnings, but probably uh, added a little bit later uh, is this chapel. Here are a series of curvilinear, small curvilinear structures, which were once uh, in the mid 20th century interpreted as beehive cells. 
of an ecclesiastical hermitage, uh, but in hindsight have to be interpreted in another way, which we'll come back to. We excavated a transect across the site, looking at three houses, um, from sort of sea to sea, so to speak, on the two main alignments that exist on the settlement, some of them being east-west, uh, and a very small number uh, being north-south. Uh, and two of those in areas B and C, we look at in most detail. Previously, the chapel had been excavated in the 1970s by Chris Morris, and that was an extremely interesting find because it, at the time it was a more or less unique find. We now have parallels for it, both in Scotland uh, and elsewhere in Britain and Ireland, from this first phase of small stone-built church construction uh, in the decades either side of the year 1000. Um, now this is a stone church which had an earlier phase which was of timber with stone cladding, uh, and it very usefully had a coin stratified between the two phases. Uh, and it's an Anglo-Saxon coin of Edgar, 959 to 975. Uh, unfortunately, we can't date the wooden phase any more tightly uh, than prior to a coin, which could, of course, have been used uh, for some decades and would have served as bullion in this context. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we're dealing with uh, an early ecclesiastical establishment. So this is either evidence for the coexistence of Christian and pagan practice in Orkney in the late Viking Age, uh, or it immediately postdates a pagan period that probably ended around uh, about <coughs> 950. Um, so on the one hand, it is an ecclesiastical site. It has a church. Uh, on the other hand, what it is not uh, is, a, is a monastic site. Uh, it, it lacks the, the classic signature criteria. There's no ecclesiastical sculpture. There's a very small number of burials, um, most of which are, in fact, of infants. Uh, and if one looks to the curvilinear features, um, they have a somewhat different and more recent provenance. Uh, they are shambles, uh, complete with shrapnel, thankfully not complete with unexploded ordinances, um, although it did make for a very interesting risk assessment uh, when uh, setting up the excavation. Um, so uh, they, they're known, and they're, they're, it, the, it's uh, recorded in folklore, of course, that the site was um, the target of shelling in both the First uh, and the Second World War for Turkmen. What is there um, are classic Scandinavian houses uh, of the, the Middle and Late Viking Age. Three old structures with internal roof supporting posts in their initial phases, central hearths, and associated portable material culture like steatite vessel fragments. There's also uh, smaller pit houses uh, associated with these, in many cases, tucked in in those uh, interesting spaces uh, between these very tightly packed houses uh, on this very nucleated settlement. And I'll just show you two of those houses here. If we think about what the settlement's all about, when one stands at the highest point in the longest building, the tip of the stack, um, one does not have control of contemporary settlement on the landward side. There are, in fact, no settlements that you can see on the landward side. It's not about controlling Orkney. It's about controlling the maritime approaches. It's about controlling the sea. And it's about being seen. And it's not alone. <coughs> because this is set at the viewship from the site. Um, there are a variety of other sites which are broadly analogous, most famously in terms of excavation, the Brock of Bursay, but one might imagine that Chet Landing sites like the Cave of Icebister falls into the same category, which have overlapping view sheds, which create a kind of comprehensive um, coverage of maritime approaches. And the, the landing site at the, at the Brock of Bursay is, uh, it, you know, is, is an interesting one, actually. So on the one hand, it, it is a good landing site. It was used as a fishing harbor uh, until the 1930s. Um, but, uh, but it's one that you need to know well in order to use safely. And in, in fact, uh, a creel boat went down uh, <coughs> in the, the, um, the bay at the Brock of Deerness while we were excavating on the site. Thankfully, the fisherman was wearing a life jacket and, and he was rescued. It's, uh, it's a it's site which is safe but not too safe, and exactly the, the sort of place for which one would uh, be able to intercept uh, passing shipping and one would be able to very clearly see uh, that passing shipping. Uh, and it's part of the system of analogous sites 
with clusters of settlements uh, probably being uh, the <coughs> sites. And if one looks at the portable material culture from the Brock, and this is sort of a, a, a selection, um, firstly, it's 10th through to 12th century in date. Secondly, it's um, from very, very diverse origins. One has Norwegian soapstone vessels, the lower right here, or probably a Norwegian spindle world. One has Anglo Saxon, this is an Anglo Saxon strap end uh, from the top right. One has uh, insular pins, like this 12, probably 12th century one, probably of Dublin manufacture. Uh, one has a comb, which would be perfectly known in either York or, uh, or Dublin in the 10th century, uh, in the bottom left, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one also has a piece of a, uh, an old brooch reused as a weight, Scandinavian old brooch reused as a weight or a gaming piece. Um, that was rather fun in particular because the tradition, of course, in Scandinavia is to take uh, insular objects, often brought from churches, and cannibalize them and turn them into weights. But here, of course, we have the insular pirates cannibalizing a Scandinavian object and turning it into weights. Uh, but uh, I doubt you know, we wouldn't read too much into that. But the, the bottom line is that the sphere of operations of whoever is living here um, is very, very widespread throughout the Irish Sea, Scandinavia, um, and the North Sea. So if one puts it all together, if one's imagining a chronology from the 9th to the end of the 12th century, maybe taking 1194 in Florabo is, is one end point, uh, one could choose others, um, then one has a, a, you know, a, a wealthy uh, earldom. Uh, pirate fisherman. Um, the next question that one has to ask, though, in order to understand wider patterns, um, is when did this start? And that's a far more difficult question. And it's been a difficult question for a variety of uh, you know, unfortunate coincidences having to do with the chronology of that which we have excavated, uh, and more fundamental methodological challenges. How am I doing this one? Okay, that's great. The first observation is that the period of raiding is not based on the archaeological evidence, nor based on comparative historical study, likely to have been the period of settlement. Because, of course, settlement happened at about 50 years after the beginning of raiding in all of the areas of the Western Viking world, be it Ireland, England, Francia. Uh, etc. And um, so, if we look to try to locate the period of settlement, then really the first moderately tightly dated evidence we have are the Viking graves dating from the mid 9th to the mid 10th century. So, really immediately before Deerness and Coiger, as we'll see in a moment. The, the, so, that kind of gives starts, we start to get our range in, if you like. Something, okay, so maybe this is starting. 850 to 950. Um, the underlying methodological problem has to do with our main dating tool outside the graves, where one can use art history and artifact typology, um, which is radiocarbon, which has these two plateaus here and here, either side of 800, and also in the 11th century, where any date will get smeared over a lengthy period of time, you know, a century or more. And that means that it, it isn't actually possible to narrow down a Scandinavian settlement, even if we found one, to more closely than, you know, sort of 8th, ninth century. Well, we might like to say, oh, this is 800, this is 793, whatever, obviously. Um, if we look at the dates of Koigru, they pick up right around 900. And thankfully miss this plateau earlier on, but don't show us any settlement before 900. This is that one, it hits that one, so it's difficult to differentiate the phases from the 10 hundreds from 11 hundreds, but that's okay. If we look at the Brock of Deerness, what I haven't discussed before is it has a pre-existing Pictish settlement on the site, which we haven't dug much of because it's under the Viking one. Um, and but it's got a hiatus here at this plateau because there's actually a gap in settlement between the Pictish site and the Scandinavian site, with the Scandinavian site actually exactly as I quoted, picking up at about 900. 
And we can see again and again, if one looks at the settlements of the Viking Yonst excavations, for instance, if we look at the chronology of Scandinavian settlements at all Scandinavians, that rather than there being a very early Viking Age settlement, that we're dealing with something which is broadly comparable with the dating that we already have from the Viking graves. So, you know, 850 to, to 950, uh, somewhere uh, within that window. So that gives us our kind of start point. We already have our end point, which is, if you like, 1194. Um, if one wanted the real final nail in the coffin, one would look to 1231. Because with Harold Madison having had his wrist slapped first by Sparrow after 1194, then by William the Lion, when he had paid 2,000 pounds of silver, I mentioned at the very beginning, in 1202, then his son and successor, John, was murdered in a cellar in Thurso in Caithness by a follower of the Norwegian representative in Orkney in 1231. And then all of the Orkanian elite aristocracy went to Bergen for the ensuing court case. And in 1232, on the way back, the ship went down. And that was, that was the real, and it no longer after that was possible for the continuation of this military economy of pirate fishermen. But OK, so we've got a beginning and an end. So what's the wider context of changes in the North Sea Irish and North Atlantic in that period? Well, the, the first observation um, is that we have a shift even within the silver hoards, for instance, from a hoard like scale uh, deposited around 950, you know, for the sake of argument, which has these very fancy objects of Irish sea manufacture, like the thistle brooches, to a hoard like Bury, deposited around 1,000, which instead is predominantly composed of these locally manufactured examples of ring So there's sort of a, a disengagement with the Irish sea province. If we look at Dublin, you know, over the, the chronology that we're considering, one sees that there's a shift, for example, from there actually being Scandinavian manufactured combs in the earliest layers to Irish styles, derivative and Irish styles of locally manufactured combs um, thereafter. And if one looks at the wider distribution within the North Atlantic world uh, of classic Hiberno-Scandinavian objects that were previously very widely distributed, even as far away as lands of Metis, for instance, like ringed pins, we see that one of the latest varieties of the ringed <coughs> pin, the kidney pin, with a chronology of about 950 to 1075, is actually very sparsely represented uh, in the Northern Isles uh, or elsewhere in the North Atlantic Scandinavian region. Or if I showed you the early variety, the polyhedral headed pins, they would have been all over the place. And at the same time, one, for example, sees a shift from the import uh, of insular canadian brooches in, their, uh, in, the, in a Norwegian context to the production of local Norwegian copies in the 10th century. And if one carries that trend through time, and this is where I'm coming to my conclusion, uh, we see in the artifactual evidence from Dublin, for instance, a shift away from Scandinavian products, as in the very earliest period in Scandinavian connections, to uh, increasingly connections with the Eastern English centers, Chester, later Bristol, but also very uh, much with France. So something has happened here. And the argument, this is a hypothesis which you can you know, like or dislike, uh, do feel free to do either, uh, is that what happened is the pipe fishing particularly in the Northern Isles, but also not discussed here, but equally relevant in the Kingdom of Man. And that, in a way, although it succeeded for two, maybe even 300 years, ultimately that political economy killed the goose that laid the cotton egg and broke apart these trade networks, so that instead, as one moves into the 11th and 12th centuries, one sees increasing uh, ultimately very large-scale trade between Norway uh, and the eastern ports of England, uh, and of course uh, with Germany and with the Low Countries. In this context, going back to the initial question raised by Benjamin Hudson, how did the Norwegian kings respond? 
and his bare legs responded with his western voyage in which he set up his son, Sigurd, as Earl of Orkney. Unfortunately for Magnus, of course, he died in Ireland in 1103. His son decided that a pilgrimage to Jerusalem was a good idea and went home and went off to Jerusalem and became Sigurd Yarsel affair, uh, ultimately King of England. Um, and so the uh, local earls were able to uh, continue the political economy for another hundred years. <coughs> 1152, the incorporation of the bishoprics of Orkney and Sonor and Man into the Archbishop of Mithras, uh, another attempt. And ultimately, of course, in 1195, Sparrow's annexation of Shetland, uh, bringing the whole story to home. Right, um, there we are. And there might be time for questions, so Donna, you might tell me that that's um, it. I'm afraid there's not a That's question to say, I'm too sorry. I'd like to thank James for his wonderful keynote speech. Baking plates from the Norwegian Kardaner quarries appeared at the 